My name is Andy Roberts. I'm from a company called Desktop Metal, which is out of Boston, Massachusetts. And the company was founded about two, a little bit over two years ago with the intent of completely changing the process by which we make metal parts using additive manufacturing. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a run through on that as well as um, show you some demos of some new software that we're developing because we're not just a hardware company, um, we're also a software company. Really quick, so this is an interesting slide that shows sort of mainframes in the early infancy of their development and 3D additive manufacturing for metal in its early stages. And you can see they're both very big machines and there's a lot of evolution that takes place in this, um, with this type of technology to make things smaller, easier to use, faster. And so we feel that this is the state that we're in today with a lot of the uh, cutting edge 3D additive manufacturing for metal. And so it's been very expensive, but it's very valuable for prototyping and production for uh, things that you don't make in massive production quantities. Um, but of course, it's, it's very interesting to make things in massive quantity production. Uh, and so the company was founded with the idea of making metal 3D printing ac accessible for engineering and manufacturing. Um, <clears throat> so in the two years that the company has been working, we've developed two systems. One of them is available right now. It's on the left. It's called the studio system. And the one on the right is a production system. Um, and that's going to be available next year or sometime this year, early next year. So the idea behind this is that we're on the left system, we're creating something that's available now that is Literally, you can run it in your office. That's why it's called desktop metal. Um, that printer, you can pick it up. Uh, two people can pick it, up, pick it up and put it on a desk. You can plug it into a regular outlet. The furnace, you can wheel it through a door. It plugs into regular power. It needs no venting. You can fire your parts, center them right in your office. So you can literally build metal parts at your desk. <clears throat> we actually have people doing this in our office. Um, the system on the right is intended to really change the game and produce, using a binder jet technology, um, parts on a massive scale. The idea is to be able to create parts that you would normally mass produce, like an impeller um, for an engine. You might make several hundred thousand a year, um, make those at a fraction of the cost at the same type of production level, so 100 times faster than what we see today. <clears throat> so the one that we have available right now is called the studio system. And we essentially took off as a starting point using metal injection molding um, materials that have been around for about 30 years. And uh, it's a very safe approach to metal because you've bound it inside rods, which you see on the upper right there. And this allows the metal to be uh, maneuvered and positioned into place when you're printing. So we use an FDM process. And <clears throat> what's special is that we have a patented technology that allows us to print not only the part, but also these interface layers here out of a ceramic material. And we literally can allow the user, when it's debound and sintered, to pull these things apart by hand. So we have a lot of intellectual property that goes into building not only the technology for printing, but also all of the materials that go into it and the process around that. And one of the big advantages of the technology right now is the interface layer. Um, because if you don't have that, uh, you can print things fairly quickly and get them out the other end but then you have to cut them off the plates, and that's very difficult. The production system operates a different way. It makes a pass every two seconds and generates a volume of parts. And I don't know the specifics. I'm not, I don't usually do the parts of the presentation that deal with the, the, the production system, but this changes the game with the way metal parts are printed. Um, it, you can print literally thousands and thousands of um, parts this way in a day. And the, the system is tied very closely to the studio system in the sense that it's the same metal powder. Instead of using an FDM process with a uh, plastic wax-like material, though, what we're doing is we're using a binder jet to spray down. So the, the bar makes a pass, and it does about 10 different things. It's laying down the powder, smoothing it, compacting it, preparing it, uh, laying down binders, anti-binders, um, curing it, and, and then making it pass the other way to build up a volume very quickly. It's the same type of metal. You put it in a process called a debinder, which removes the, the wax plastic material, leaving these metal particles that are essentially uh, very close together with tiny gaps. 
In the sintering process, they compact and shrink and form a fully dense part. Um, what's interesting about it is the metal powder that we use in this technology isn't the same type of powder that you use for laser-based systems. Um, with laser-based systems, you have to have powder that um, reacts to the laser very similarly. So you have, if you have a bell curve of the shape of your particles through an atomization process or whatever, you can only use some of those particles um, because they excite with the laser a certain way. Um, with this, it's almost like you can use the garbage particles that are on the outer ends of the bell curve. Um, it doesn't really matter what the shape and size of those particles are. In fact, the more irregular they are, the better they hook together and, and fuse to create a solid. So you can end up using all of the particles that you produce with a, a powderization process, and therefore the material is a lot cheaper. It's on the order of maybe $60 a kilogram, as opposed to maybe 1,000. <clears> so I'm not going to get into the benefits of additive manufacturing or the industry size and all that. But what I do want to talk about is the software that we created in the last year or so. Um, a lot of our customers are coming to us and saying, well, we, ha you know, we have big companies, um, automotive companies, aerospace companies, but even companies that make like power tools and so forth. And they're coming to, the, to us with their existing parts and saying, well, you know, can we print this? And the answer is, well, yes, we can. But we, we notice that parts have things like draft angles on them and parting lines. And we're like, well, you do know that you don't need to print parts that look like that because this is additive manufacturing. You can print things in all sorts of shape, shapes and sizes. Um, and that's true, but the question is, well, how do we print parts that take advantage of additive manufacturing? And the answer isn't so easy because in, well, in the process that we're using, we're printing in different ways. Some of it's FDM, some of it's powder, um, and then you go into the sintering process and you have to orient parts a certain way and when you debind and remove the material, there's all these factors that affect, you know, it's physics and chemistry, and it's very difficult to understand how to create a part that might be optimizing on all these different fronts. Not just shape, you know, for stress and strain, but also understanding all of the different characteristics of the manufacturing process that go into it. So we thought, well, how can we build software that maybe better handles this? Um, and my background is I was one of the original people back at parametric technology like 30 years ago that invented feature-based modeling. Um, and so I've lived and breathed feature-based modeling for a long time. But then I got out of the CAD space entirely and I was doing other kinds of software. And a number of years ago, like eight years ago, I had this idea, um, what if you could make software that made parts the way plants and animal cells grow during their embryonic stages? And it was really a crazy idea. <clears throat> The reason I sort of sat on it for a while was because you could imagine growing parts, but the question was, well, how do you make them? If you had to put it into a CNC machine and machine it, well, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. Um, but now with additive manufacturing breaking through on all these boundaries, it turns out that you actually can start to think of making a part that grows like a plant. Um, so the idea is we're going to take a, a, a part and replace the entire concept of what it is with a bunch of cells. We're going to grow the thing. Um, when I say nature-inspired algorithms, what I mean is that I actually sat down and looked at how embryos form in the very early stages of life. Because after all, you go from a single cell to a blob of cells, and as they grow, they start to differentiate themselves, and they break apart and change you know, formations. Um, and I wanted to understand that. And it turns out that it's all done by the cells communicating with each other using chemicals. It's called morphogenesis. And basically, the cells are reacting based on their DNA. That's their instruction set. <clears throat> but they're communicating with each other by diffusing chemicals to their surrounding environment. That's how like, the zebra gets its stripes. It's different cells communicating with each other, creating different pigments. And that gives the stripes on the zebra. So what we did is we used nature-inspired al algorithms to actually model the way cells interact with each other. The other thing we did is we said, well, in the gaming world, you have these screaming fast machines you know, with a GPU on it. Um, in fact, the one that I was going to use right down there has uh, 3,000 cores on it. Um, but the, the pathetic one that I have up here has 900 cores. It still runs really fast. Uh, we wanted to use GPUs because you can have, on a, on a single computing platform, you can have thousands of GPUs running in parallel to do the simulations, all the calculations. 
And we wanted all the cell-to-cell -cell interactions to be modeled using GPUs. Um, and then the other thing is we wanted to make this thing realize the full potential of additive manufacturing. So into all of these little cells, program the rules that are important to making metal parts, or really any kind of part, but metal is one of them. So that's an example of a part that was 3D printed using our FDM studio system. Um, and it shows the sort of the freeform nature you can get. The parts do look like bones and, and tree branches and stuff. I'll show you that running in a minute. So, but anyway, the, the features, it's designed for 3D printing. It's um, incredibly real time. I mean, you can literally move the, the controls and the thing morphs and grows to adapt to the changes. Um, so it, it works in minutes. And then finally, we've done an integration to SolidWorks. Um, you could integrate it with any type of a design tool, um, but we chose to integrate it with SolidWorks first. And we have an add-in to SolidWorks that makes it seamless to go back and forth. So, <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to go ahead and give a demo. But I will switch from computer one to computer two here. All right. So what we're seeing here is the Live Parts app, and it <clears throat> it runs in the cloud, but it also runs on standalone machines. It uses the GPU technology I was talking about. So basically what we're doing here is we're going to grow a part. And the idea is that we've got this set of boundary conditions that are represented by the blue. And then we have a keep out region on the top there. Now what's happening is we, we have a seed cell planted down here. And in the same way that plants grow towards the sun and the roots grow towards water, um, these grow towards the location where forces are going to be applied. Um, in nature, the reason a plant grows towards the sun is because the cells on the top are reacting to photosynthesis, and they're producing a chemical. And that chemical is diffused to the surrounding cells. And A, it causes the cells on the tip to reproduce because they're, the they're the meristem growing towards the, the light. But B, it tells the other cells, chill out. You're not the ones growing. I'm the one growing. And of course, then when the cells eventually grow above it, the signal turns off because the lower cells are no longer feeling the photosynthesis. So they're no longer producing that chemical. So they take on a different role and perform a different function. And, um, and so the same thing is happening here. But what's also happening is that while this thing is growing, the cells are feeling the, the strain. And that's what the color is. And the strain is causing them to grow child cells. And then in the areas where they're not doing anything anymore, like this area, which is going to die off and get killed pretty soon, what's happening there is that the cells are being killed away by a virus. So this is like a crazy cellular organism. It's got viruses. It has all sorts of weird behaviors running around inside it. Um, the cells are all communicating with each other. And at the same time, though, we can always freeze the growth and tell it that we want it to be smoothed out. And it builds a nice, smooth part for us. And if I look at the mesh here, you know, it's, it has a mesh representation. Um, but what's more is it has this cell representation inside it where all sorts of interesting things can happen at the cell level. For example, cells near each other can realize that they're in a fat section of the part. And they can start building little crevices to split it apart so that debinding material can easily get in to make it debind better. Right? That's not something that you need to worry about as a designer, but the cells can make your parts automatically manufacture better. Another thing is, in the areas where you have sharp edges, the cells can know about, I'm sideways cells, and these guys can say, I'm upward facing cells. And where they come together and the chemicals diffuse, all of a sudden the cells on the edge can say, ooh, I'm in the edge where I have a sharp edge, and they can auto build a fillet. So we can have these low-level cell rules that can cause the part to have uh, to build features like fillets without the thing knowing what a fillet is, which is a crazy idea, but it actually works. Um, so anyway, this is very interactive. I showed you. Um, I showed you. Well, this is another example that shows that we can have cells growing. These these seed cells growing from multiple locations. Um, up to a common target, and they just sort of fuse together. You can see they fuse together, and then they go on their merry way. Um, what, what's happening here is the organism is growing into a single blob, um, and then we can have forces that can be very dynamic. Um, this one's static at the moment, but what we can do is 
we can model over time the forces changing. So instead of having to define load case one and load case two and load case three, we actually model all the load cases with transitional functions. So if you want impulses or vibrations or um, like there, that's an impulse, you can have that kind of behavior and the organism actually reacts to that over time. So it'll get stronger based on how the standing waves build up inside the part. Um, so the idea is you're, you're modeling this thing as it really would exist in nature. You know, like in nature, uh, nobody sketches a tree, it just grows. But furthermore, it grows in an environment that's constantly changing. So one day, you know, it might be nice and calm, but the next day you might get you know, wind blowing in the, le in, the, in the leaves, and the next day you might get a hurricane. Um, what we're doing is we're modeling here all those forces at the same time, but we're also modeling things like, you see the slider over there with the gravity? We're actually modeling gravity waves to oscillate the part and wiggle and jiggle it. And that, we find that that makes the parts really strong when, go to, when they go into the printing process. So we're really playing with a lot of concepts from nature here that aren't fully understood yet. Um, but that's one of the reasons that we released this product right now early was because we wanted to give people the ability to play around with this. Um, let's see what this one looks like. All right, so this is a pretty funky part. Um, this one has, just to point out one other thing, this one has a symmetry plane in it. Right now, normally in something like SolidWorks, you would do um, symmetry planes with a mirror feature, right? I mean, I actually did the mirror feature back at Parametric Technology back in 95 or so. Um, you know, the idea is you model half of something, you flip it over and mirror it, right? Well, we didn't want to do that because this thing's alive. We didn't want to like cut it in half and say, well, we're only going to model half of you. So we, we modeled symmetry using the, the chemical diffusion models and the, chemical, the cell signaling models. So what we're doing with symmetry is when cells are trying to reproduce over on this side, they're sensing the same through chemical diffusion what's going on on the other side. And they're going to be a little bit lazy and not reproduce if nothing's happening on the other side. If the other side catches up, then they'll catch up. So symmetry is a very sort of low-level organic thing that we can control in the system to get nice symmetrical parts. And it works the same way it does in nature. You know, think of it. You have two hands, two eyes, but you only have one heart. So symmetry is a weird thing in nature because it turns on and off locally based on the function of the cells. So again, we're trying to learn as much as we can from nature to do this. Um, just real quickly, the way it works. So inside SolidWorks, you set up your boundary conditions. Um, I won't go into detail on the features here. But when we export this, we can give it a name. So we'll just call this foo. And what we're doing is we're exporting this live parts definition up to the cloud where we run live parts. Um, it runs basically in a VM so that you, can, you don't have to go out and buy a machine that has a 5,000 core GPU. You can use one in the cloud. Um, and this is basically exporting the model so that we, it's not exporting your whole model, it's just exporting the geometry uh, boundaries. So in this case, what we're doing is we're building a throttle arm that goes from here to here and stays out of a few keep out regions. And when we go over to live parts, you can open this up. So what we're doing here is we're saying we want to download this thing and it will bring it in and here it is. And we can start it growing and off it goes. So what it's doing is it's, it's growing down towards this target location. You can have all sorts of forces defined, functions of time and position and so forth. Um, this one's just going to grow a, a, a section down here. These cells, as they grow and they start feeling the force, you can see that force transmitted all the way up into here. And this is a fixed region, the shaft. So it's basically just growing to support its function. And you know, at any time, I can freeze this. So I could say, OK, I want to smooth it. It's not even done yet. But we can smooth it. And we can say export. And this is going to do the same thing. It's going to send it back into the cloud. And I can go back now to SolidWorks and say, I want to import it. And it gives me the same key value. It pulls it down sticks it on my machine. Now it's assembling it. Now keep in mind, I didn't let the thing grow totally, but there it is. And what's interesting is, you know, I gave it this keep out region to stay out of up around these bolt heads. Um, 
that was really important. The idea is, you know, we're building a part that has to fit into an assembly. Um, I actually have the assembly right here for anybody who wants to see it later on. Um, but this, this part, it's, it's actually in this sort of normal looking throttle assembly, but it has to stay out of this area and it has to nicely blend and do all that stuff. Um, so it's very important that you be able to have your, this crazy new tool, this live parts thing, integrated with your CAD environment so you can just move things in and out like we did here. Um, and so that's the way we operate with a CAD environment. So I think that um, to summarize, I want to point out that we have a, a partner company here, TriTech, that's uh, at, at stand 82. Um, I, wouldn't, I have a slide normally that would show you that, but my, my presentation's got screwed up here. Um, but if you want more information on desktop metal, um, go to stand 82, and Colin will be happy to talk to you about the, uh, the types of machines we have, how they work. Um, if you want to find me, I'll be around at the rest of the show. If you want to see any of these demos running on a machine that's like five times faster than that, um, you're welcome to. Um, you can also go to Desktop Metal to the site and look, at, look for live parts. And you can use it today. Anybody can sign up. You don't need a Desktop Metal printer to use it. Anybody can use it. You don't even need a CAD system if you want to just play with it. It's free to, free to do that. Um, but if you do, if you're, if you're a SolidWorks user, you can use the add-in and start working with uh, live parts to create your own parts. So with that, I think we're, we're out of time. I don't know if there are any questions quick, but you can certainly come up afterwards, too. Any questions or even comments? You know, anyone want to make any comments on what they've seen today? Or... <coughs> yes. What is the quality of the final printed metal parts on a density basis? Um, it's at least 98%. Um, so we're getting, we're getting very, very good results. It's, it's very similar to what you get with metal injection molding. So all the materials are qualified and the, the process is well known. You know, the process, metal injection molding has been around for years. You make a mold, you squish the material in, you take it, you debind it, and you center it. So we have the same types of results that you get with that industry. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed your time.